Hi, uh, welcome to uh, the last installment of our Global Neuroscience Institute conference. Uh, it's been an incredible three days and we appreciate everyone uh, logging in, checking in, and all the incredible questions that you've had. And now we're going to uh, round off with kids. Um, and kids are not just uh, little adults. And I'm very fortunate to be here with uh, one of my partners, Dr. Tina Lovin, who will convince us that uh, kids need surgery too, and maybe sometimes not. And we'll go over some of the things that we've been up to at St. Christopher's Hospital. Tina? Hi, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, my name is Tina Lovin, and I am a pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, my favorite part of uh, pediatric neurosurgery are my patients because they are so freaking good, uh, cute. And uh, you'll see soon, I'll have a couple of uh, cases I wanted to just show you um, on what comes in the door. And uh, uh, that's the other reason why I like pediatric neurosurgery is you, um, you see, see a, a lot of things and uh, they really range from uh, a, a child who bumps their head to uh, congenital problems and uh, uh, some aqu unfortunate acquired things like tumors and epilepsy. So um, this is one of my patients and uh, as you can see uh, it's an adorable uh, little a gal who uh, came to uh, our neurosurgery clinic and uh, um, the parents had noticed that the forehead looked a little odd. So um, the baby was born, um, breached and uh, was assisted uh, with forceps on delivery and uh, you know the baby's skulls are pretty thin so um, as soon as I saw this baby I, I uh, was suspecting that there was a fracture. And uh, uh, the baby skulls fracture in a very unusual way. They, they uh, are so um, soft that it's, uh, it's what we call a ping pong fracture. Um, the, the bone is like uh, young wood. It just kind of bends but doesn't really break. So uh, what we did is we sent this uh, little one for a scan just to confirm and just kind of get an idea. Uh, what we were dealing with, and uh, um, this is what we saw. And, uh, you know, we took the baby um, to uh, surgery, and it was a very simple procedure. We basically just made a small nick in the skin, and uh, um, we were able to, uh, with a very, very small opening to the bone, to just kind of put an instrument in and elevate the, the, the bone back up. Sometimes uh, these uh, fractures can be elevated with just a vacuum, but this uh, um, fracture had been sitting there for a little over a month, so uh, it, didn't, it wasn't as easy as we, we, uh, it could be if they uh, just happen and you can intervene right away. What would you have said to the parents? They would have said, well, surgery is awfully scary. I want to see what happens. So that's always an option, but yeah. uh, you're going you, you to have a pretty upset uh, uh, teenager, yeah. especially a girl when they, uh, they have a big dent in their forehead. And, uh, you know, we always have to reassure the parents because it is very scary yeah. when you're talking about a little baby going to surgery, sure. going to sleep. This yeah. will be their first anesthesia experience, it's always, you know, very, haircut. very scary. <laughs> Just letting go of your baby for that sure. amount of time, we make sure that we really, really take great care on taking care of the parents just as much as we sure. take care of the, the, the babies. We call them from the operating room, okay, we are making an incision, we're getting started, yeah. okay, we're closing, everything went well, and, and you know, we're really you know, that's, that's really part of the, uh, the, the whole uh, experience of pediatric neurosurgeries is uh, the, the parents are just as important and just as much patients as your, your patient is. Yes. Yeah. Well, what does he look like, or so, she? So she looks, you know, again, adorable, <laughs> just as adorable as with the dent, but uh, I think this will be a happier <laughs> teenager. And uh, he's going to need a lot less makeup, so. <laughs> <laughs> and how are the parents? So parents, very, very happy. Good. And, and they, uh, 
they left the next day and and all went well. Awesome. That's why we Well, what, you know, did you, what, what took so long to have that child presented to you? I mean, it does not take a neurosurgeon <laughs> to realize yeah, something you know, is, is off here. Yeah, that was very interesting. Um, so I, I think the hope was that uh, maybe it'll just pop back on its own. Um, I'm not quite so sure on, on what happened there, but the, the pediatrician, uh, you know, certainly... Uh, these were first-time parents, so sure. you know they don't know how the babies are supposed to look, and all babies kind of look <laughs> funny when they come out. You know they have all kinds you say of. Say that to all the parents. <laughs> like you say, all babies look like aliens. <laughs> that's, that's my kids that look like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, you know, I guess. You, you know, if you go back to that extra uh, or the CAT scan, a couple yeah. things. One, uh, so CAT scans are radiation and. Uh, it's obviously the best way of looking at bone, but at what point in time, there are two questions here. When do you use a CAT scan versus an MRI in a little kiddo? Does this yeah. kiddo have to be put to sleep for that? And also, you call that a ping pong fracture. I think somebody in our audience was wondering why such a benign name to something that needs surgery. So, um, CAT scans we use uh, when we want to get a very good look at the bone. Yeah. And you know we certainly want to avoid radiation on uh, children, uh, young people, pretty much on everybody. Um, and we have uh, instituted a number of protocols to do MRIs whenever we can. But unfortunately, MRI does not give the best look at the bone. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case, was it really necessary to get a CAT scan? Um, you could argue it because you know you see really what you're dealing with, but you also want to see, make sure that there's really nothing bad underlying, okay. uh, that yeah. there's not a big, big hemorrhage and uh, you know or something that you would have to worry about. So that will give you uh, answer to both. It'll give you an answer to what the bone looks like. And we have a protocol for the kiddos to give them the least amount of radiation sure. with the CAT scans, yeah, so it doesn't give you the best detail but it gives you just enough that you know what you're doing and you can do it safely. And to the second part of the question, why such a benign name? Uh, uh, you know, anyone who's played ping pong, um, <laughs> when your ping pong ball gets dented, it looks just like this. Uh, I, I didn't invent it, I think it's a cute name. And, and uh, it also helps when you're talking about the fracture, okay, it's a ping pong fracture. It's going to be an easy, easy thing to <laughs> elevate, just like a ping pong. You just squeeze it a little bit, and it'll pop right back up. Okay. <laughs> so. What else do you have for us to look at? Um, so this um, is another cutie. Um, they're all cuties to you. They're though. all cuties. Okay. That's that's all right. why my all job right. is so great. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, and, my, and my staff uh, uh, can attest to that because we just run around in clinic and say, oh my goodness, did you see that baby? How adorable. Oh, did you see the outfit? Uh, so yeah, we, we, we a little silly in <laughs> pediatric neurosurgery. Um, this baby came in with a, um, a funny shaped head. We see a lot of funny shaped heads. Sometimes they completely benign. Uh, they just get better with uh, repositioning the baby. Uh, sometimes when the babies uh, are um, in one position in, uh, in utero, one side of the head gets flat. If the babies prefer to sleep on one side, that side gets flat. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of funny shaped heads. But um, you know, we are also very tuned to what's just a funny shape and what's pathological. So baby heads are all made out of uh, pieces of bone uh, that's connected by um, lines called sutures. So uh, the sutures have a certain order of uh, turning into bone, into fusing, uh, in order to make up the skull into a certain shape. Uh, if the sutures fuse too early, they can create problems. Uh, and uh, one of the you know, most common sutures to, to fuse, like in this case, is the sagittal suture. So you can see that there's all these lines that are open, but right in the middle, 
um, that suture on a three month old is closed and that's not normal. So what would happen with this baby is the baby's head would be very, very long and narrow, a, a sort of a boat shaped head. So this was picked up early by a, a very uh, a good pediatrician and sent to us and we were able to treat this baby early. So we have uh, is, some is of the- Is there an advantage to treating early versus late? Or what do you feel? So I, I think so. I, I think the earlier that we catch these um, uh, single suture uh, synostosis, uh, uh, early fusions, the easier they are the, to treat and the be better the cosmetic results is. Uh, the bone is very, very thin and if we catch them early, we can treat them with minimally invasive techniques. Got it. Is that um, what uh, you're showing here? So this is actually a baby that was treated with an endoscopic um, suturectomy. Wow. Where we make just uh, a, a very small incision. There's very minimal blood loss. Sure. Babies usually don't need any blood transfusions. They, uh, instead of spending two, three days in the hospital, they go home the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, the cosmetic result is excellent. Uh, we, we do use molding helmets afterwards, but they uh, usually uh, do very, very well. So I think there's a certain advantage of uh, being able to treat this sure. early. Um, and what would you say to a parent if they uh, came to you because their pediatrician sent them and they were apprehensive about the operation or the synostosis? Well, this, this one in particular, would this affect their cognitive abilities or their ability to develop and do well ultimately? Or? So it can, it can be argued that certain uh, degrees of synostosis can um, be uh, uh, elected not to treat, um, especially um, very, very mild um, metopic synostosis where the sure. forehead um, ridge fuses but there's really no uh, significant cosmetic um, deformity. Um, but on the other hand, um, the, uh, it can be argued that it can cause problems because Absolutely. if there's not enough uh, space, if one of the sutures fuses early, it can uh, create problems with increased intracranial pressures um, and that can lead to cognitive problems and other problems. You know, I think that changed also over time as you started having more endoscopic approaches. I know in my training, we were sort of a little bit blasé about whether we should fix these or not. But you're right, uh, Tina, if the brain vault is supposed to expand and grow in a certain way, presumably it's better for the brain if it can. Yeah. So you're just allowing physiology to occur. And, and it's such a small surgery uh, if, if it's done, done early. Um, that, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think it has more advantages sure. than disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, of course, every surgery is risky. And if it's your child, you know, it, it should yeah. not be taken of course. lightly because bad things can happen. Um, so what's this one look like? This one is, again, adorable. <laughs> <laughs> adorable round head. Adorable round head. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes we don't catch these early because they can be very subtle. Yeah. They can also get, uh, you know, worse with when months go on. So if it's not picked up within the first six months, then what do you do? Yeah. That's um, a excellent point. There's, there's still options. Um, and uh, they, those options should still be considered uh, because of what we talked about, sure. that you can have problems with cognitive development, with increased pressures. The surgery still, we can make it, we'll make it very safe. We do it uh, together with our plastic surgery colleagues to make sure that the cosmetics results are as good as they, they can be. Um, but th then it's gonna look um, a little bit more extensive. Uh, for example, this is the same suture that was uh, uh, treated with open surgery. Yeah. Uh, and you can see, you know, eventually all of that is going to be covered by hair. Um, you can see the, suit, the incision can be done in multiple ways. Uh, uh, a, a lot of the times we do a bicoronal, which is kind of an ear to ear 
behind the hairline incision or uh, like in this case it's, it's kind of a lazy S, lazy S uh, that also is nicely covered under hair and uh, you don't really once it heals you don't really uh, see see any uh, traces of it unless you go looking for it. I think it's a good point to highlight for parents or even uh, uh, folks that are going to refer people to you that this is a cosmetic surgery on the top but it's a brain surgery on the bottom and uh, you're making sure that at least the cosmetics are dealt with by those kind of curious incisions, right? Yeah. I mean that's, uh, and, and also you alluded to it that plastic surgery is pretty important. Yeah. And if there's any um, more extensive uh, work to be done, if it's a multi-suture synesthosis, um, the plastic surgeons are excellent in using uh, models um, of perfect head shapes to allow them to shape yeah. the, uh, uh, the reconstruction to be as, as good as cosmetically possible. Now these are these are kind of big surgeries, and you can imagine that there's some blood loss, but I have to imagine that you know, kids can't tolerate a whole lot of blood loss. So what are the maneuvers, aside from being incredibly meticulous in the operating room, that, uh, that you pay attention to? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, you know, obviously, we take um, great care on uh, um, you know, really making sure that the hemostasis uh, sure. is, is uh, from the beginning to end optimized. Um, but there's also medications that can be given uh, that sort of reduce the, the, the blood loss. Um, there's uh, also a way to kind of recirculate the blood. Um, but most of the time we just prepare the families that there will be a blood transfusion and we don't certainly want to fall behind so we we kind of start that early if we see we have a big surgery with a lot of bony cuts uh, we'll start the blood transfusion uh, early and it's it, it usually very back, well it, it almost plays back into your point of doing these surgeries earlier and younger yeah uh, probably means that they're less what we would call morbid or bigger and probably less likely need for any kind of transfusion. Yeah, right? sure, yeah. sure. And and as you can see, this kind of surgery, they're not going to go home the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they usually swell. You know, the eyes are closed for uh, a day or two, yeah, and sure. uh, and they they're not ha as happy campers as the endoscopic kiddos. Again, you know, the end result is the same. It's just the process is a little bit different. Sure. Um, and some, you know, even single suture uh, synesthosis, some, you know, if you, you need to evaluate it, can you do it safely uh, endoscopically or would it be best served to do it with a little bit of a bigger incision? Uh, so it's always, safety is always the most important. For practitioners to know, is there a time cutoff that you generally say, okay, we're moving from endoscopic to open um, or is it really kid? Uh, pediatric uh, child, pediatric child based? Yeah, so after six months the endoscopic is really not no. as optimal. So it's almost a reason for making sure that people do see you soon enough to at least have that window of opportunity for endoscopic versus then committing themselves only to open. Yeah, I mean the, the three months is, is really the perfect time sure. to do as scary as it might be to the parents. As scary as it might yeah. be, um, but the, the bone is so thin and so um, easy to, to, to mold at that point that the, that's, um, that's a, the best time, in my opinion, to, to do sure. these surgeries. As obviously if all the med other medical issues um, are taken into consideration. Now I know you have some lumps and bumps as you like to call them. Why don't you show us yeah, so, what you've been digging okay. out? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we, most, of, most of my day uh, uh, goes by at looking at head shapes and say, hey, what do you think of this lump? What do you think of this bump? Um, you know, oftentimes we get asked like, what is this you know, big thing on the back? And Sometimes it's the normal anatomy. And, and, and it's being normal anatomy that in a growing skull, especially if it's a first child, sure, it's always uh, always sent over to us, and we are so happy to see all these all these cuties. Um, but you know, sometimes you see something like this and say, "Hey, yeah, there's there's a problem here. There's uh, something wrong." So um, 
this was a five-year-old who uh, comes in and they've been kind of watching this big midline lump that seems to just be getting bigger and bigger and uh, the uh, pediatrician has been looking at it, mom's been looking at it and then finally uh, they they say okay it's not going away it's not a it's not a birth uh, birth injury a lot of the times um, the, during birthing process there's little bleeds that end up being um, calcified hematomas and and they they uh, they can present as lumps but uh, this was a little bit of a different kind of a lump so um, again, we did a few scans just because of where it was. We sure. were kind of worried because it was right smack in the middle and there are some big vessels that run underneath there. So we wanted to uh, do not just a uh, CAT scan, but we also got an MRI and uh, we wanted to see how much of a uh, defect that we were dealing with um, uh, on, the, on the skull. And uh, uh, thankfully, there was really no brain involvement in mm -hmm. this. Uh, so it did penetrate the skull fully, um, but it looked like it was separate from the dura and from the, uh, the big vessel that runs, big vein that runs right smack in the middle there. Now, just to be uh, kind of clearer for people, this is probably something you don't necessarily need plastic surgery help with. Do you or did you? No, yeah. these yeah these these are just uh, you these know, are a little just, bit more straightforward, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, these are yeah. pretty straightforward, um, and uh, you know this will hide the incision again. You know, just what like we did with the uh, synesthesis cases, we always consider cosmesis in sure. in kids. But if anyone was asking, would this be an endoscopic case necessarily, or? Or probably well, maybe not so know, much. Depends. If this was in the forehead, um, you know, sure, uh, you wouldn't want to put an incision right on the sure. forehead. Yeah. Uh, but this was uh, clearly behind uh, the hairline, so we were easily able to sneak in there. And uh, I think just because of where this is, uh, I wanted to see where I was getting yeah, to and, and, and just to make it safe. So this is... Uh, Whoa. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> this is what we found. That, that's something not to see after it lunch. It looked like a mushroom. <laughs> yes, yes. And then it came out very easily. Uh, and then we played with it a little bit before we sent it to pathology and opened it. So it looked uh, like a, uh, uh, a big, large pimple inside. It does look like. There, so gonna, this is that how you're going to officially sign out the yes, path? Yes, yes. Called a, uh, a skull pimple. No, this is a, this is actually a large dermoid, which yeah. is a, a, one of the most, more common uh, skull skull bumps that we see in, in children. And and I have to imagine that once you take it out, that's it. Right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. That's it. Fantastic. So that's a that's kind of a happy diagnosis, saying okay, we're done now. And on a five year old, you know, we just took a little bit of the bony edges out to make sure that uh, uh, the bone starts growing back and there's no, uh, uh, usually no uh, implant or anything uh, needed for that. Okay. So okay. Uh, I guess the, uh, what's, your, what's your next case? Because you, we can't do, we can't talk about pediatric neurosurgery without seeing at least one shunt. So, and if we see one shunt, then where's the next shunt? So uh, there's got to be a shunt somewhere here. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> shunts are probably the most common, the most common, they are. Yeah, and maybe um, just to clarify for folks, what are shunts doing? So, so shunts are, um, are basically, we, we become plumbers yeah. uh, of the brain. Um, they, there's all these fluid spaces that normally exist in everybody's brain. Uh, and there's a very delicate balance uh, between how much fluid gets made versus how much fluid gets absorbed and circulated all around. And when that balance gets disturbed for yeah. one reason or another, um, just like your, your um, pipes, uh, bathroom pipes get clogged up, uh, the brain pipes get clogged up. Sure. And uh, uh, that is the most common problem that we see in uh, in children and uh, oftentimes we see uh, problems with very 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 tiny humans who are born too early. Uh, the tiny humans 
their, um, their vessels that line the um, fluid spaces are not developed fully and they, uh, they tend to uh, bleed. And when they bleed, the blood get, gets into the pristine spinal fluid spaces and, and uh, things happen, but the end result is that the absorption part um, does not work anymore. The spinal fluid keeps getting made, but it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's like you said, the plumbing just gets clogged up and yeah. then there's a problem. So, you know, then what do we do about it? So ba basically there's two different problems that can happen. The fluid doesn't get absorbed or there's a, there's a block somewhere um, that causes an obstruction and, yeah. and uh, the pathways are not, not what they should be. Um, most of the time, you know, we treat the, uh, uh, the obstructions as well as the absorption problems in very little uh, babies by uh, inserting shots. Sure. In older children or um, uh, teenagers, if we have a problem with an obstructed pathway, uh, we have other treatments that uh, work very well, and those are called uh, endoscopic pathways that we make. We'll make new pathways for the, the obstructed portions uh, for the fluid to uh, circulate through, but in the very itty bitty babies, the, those, those pathways don't work as well as the shunts do. Um, so, you know, there's very, very simple uh, uh, shunts that you put a shunt in and it works great and you never have to do anything except see the, 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 the child. Um. And just to clarify, shunting means just taking fluid from one space and putting it somewhere else. Correct. Not yes. necessarily into the brain, right? Correct. So um, the most common pathway that we, uh, the new pathway that we make for the extra fluid is we uh, um, transport the fluid from the um, brain um, fluid spaces into another uh, sterile fluid space in the, in the belly. So we'll have a little silicone tubing that goes under the skin uh, that's connected from the ventricles. Uh, and uh, um, we usually want to make sure that there's a pressure valve so not too much fluid uh, runs uh, through it. So anytime the, the pressures grow too high, the valves open up and allow the fluid to circulate. So you really are and a run. I really am a plumber, yeah. <laughs> and, That's and what, right. What, 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 what happens uh, when you say it, because uh, actually amongst ourselves we always talk about this, uh, well, how long will that shunt last? Or what do you say to a parent when you're talking to them for the first time and they're already apprehensive and you're uh, bestowing an operation on their uh, child and then in, in, unlike that dermoid case where you said, wow, <laughs> we're done yeah. and this was awesome and this is great. Yeah. How do you have that discussion with the shunt families? Because it's a really challenging one, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's true. Usually I you know, start by saying, we'll be friends for life. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's, them to the adult yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, unfortunately most of the time, um, it's a li lifelong relationship yeah. and uh, uh, it can be a very happy relationship. Surgical. No, yeah. no. The, the dream of a pediatric neurosurgeon is to have a shunt that you place yeah. uh, for a child that you'll just observe observe and yeah. see every you know couple every year every couple of years and say hey everything's working great mm -hmm. nothing needs to be done um, we like to try to leave enough tubing that even with the growth of the child sure. um, there's enough there that uh, they don't outgrow their shunts um, but unfortunately that's um, oftentimes a pipe dream and we do so need to, to do yeah. <laughs> uh, revisions and, and another revision, another revision. But, but that's not necessarily an awful thing. It, it is not, it, it's no. It's ex, kind of an expected or yeah. potentially expected outcome. Sure, and you know, I had mentioned earlier that the endoscopic um, treatment then becomes potentially an option. Yeah. If you have a baby then uh, uh, yeah outgrows the shunt or shunt stops working, that's always something that we, uh, we look at. Can we make this, uh, can we get this child shunt free? So you must have some pictures of shunts that you can dazzle us with. Yeah, so I have a very, <laughs> this is a very Whoa. classic yeah, um, that is. kind of a picture. This is a, 
X29 weaker, had a bleed in the ventricles from prematurity sure. and uh, uh, was observed, developed big ventricles, received a shunt, shunt working. This is a, a, a follow-up picture. So, so just so people understand, that picture on the left, the white spaces are the the, the fluid spaces that are really out of proportion, aren't they? Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you can see the, the brain even in that picture looks really white because it's not really Just mature. The, the yeah. yeah, so that's, that's a, a part of the lack of myelination and also um, being unhappy, um, like Dr. Sarkar here <laughs> said. That's not a happy brain. No, but the next picture really looks about as near normal as you might expect, don't you think? Near normal. Yeah, you have the to be pretty happy with that. The fluid spaces are still yeah, pretty big. Of course, um, sure, but. But they are, they are much, much more normal looking, and this is uh, uh, just a year later, so uh, this, this child's <coughs> fluid spaces should still get smaller uh, as they grow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, uh, that little red, uh, colored thing there, that's that catheter that I've outlined just to kind of show where the catheters travel through. Um, so this is a, uh, this is the, uh, the end result. And, uh, you know, again, if the shunt works, we don't touch it. Absolutely. But if the shunt starts giving us trouble, then we'll, we'll have to think of other options. And, and, and sometimes it's uh, just being uh, also um, educating also everybody about once kids have shunts, every cough, sniffle, sneeze, um, or fart does not mean that there's a shunt disorder, correct? Right. But, but it do. doesn't mean you can't <laughs> not rule it out. Yeah. So we, we do um, a lot of scare testing. our, yeah. our, our <laughs> ER uh, for uh, doctors and pediatricians as well as our parents to just be on a watch out. If there's a shunt, we always have to consider that that might be the cause of the increased farting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> most of the time it's not, but we always, we always uh, are on a, on a lookout for problems. Uh, that's why we, we like to see the um, uh, shunt children or children with shunts uh, uh, in a regular basis sure. so we know yeah. how they look when exactly. they are healthy. Yeah. We also like to occasionally get some pictures so we know how the ventricles look when they are healthy, especially when they're growing. We don't kind of know, we want to get what their healthy baseline Absolutely. is. Because if we never got a picture after the, the initial picture there on the left, yeah. we wouldn't know when they have a problem. And, and, and it looks like you were, uh, that other picture is, uh, is an MRI scan. Yeah, um, so they both actually MRI scans. Yeah. The um, MRI scan on the left just looks kind of funny because the baby is so premature. No, but just the point that you made about oh, yeah. saving, so, saving kids from radiation and things like that. Yes, uh, yes, yes. What about some, some parents or some uh, uh, providers might uh, understand that shunts are programmable. What does that have to do with MRI compatibility and things, do they have to worry about it? What's, what's happening yeah. with that technology? So, so that technology uh, has really developed quite a bit uh, because that was always the, um, the problem with the uh, programmable shunt sure. valves that if you put a magnet close to it, it would change the setting. Uh, sometimes even devices like iPads could potentially change the settings of the shunt valves. The programmable shunt valves are sort of neat because um, you can change the settings and, and avoid uh, some of the problems that we see yeah. with shunted children like slit ventricle syndrome. You can adjust the pressures once their skull bones fuse uh, and uh, uh, dial them up or down as, right. as needed. Uh, so that could potentially avoid surgery. Of course, the other caveat is that the, the valves are a little bit more complex. Um, you, you know, certainly more expensive and... Uh, um, but it also means that each adjustment is not a surgery. Exactly. Oh, you can probably exactly. remember as a resident, every time you wanted to change something, if you didn't, if you had a fixed valve, so to speak, that was an operation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you... So there's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of benefit because if you discover that your shunt valve is draining too much uh, and you have a fixed valve in, 
you know, you can't change yeah. that without opening up the, mm. the incision. And anytime you open up the incision, the risk of a malfunction or an infection, infection. goes up uh, uh, tremendously. So yeah. that's, uh, that's certainly a uh, case. So, you know, sometimes we see uh, just kind of a simple, uh, I don't want to say simple, but simple. Uh, straightforward yeah. uh, but hydrocephalus. You've got to have something more wacky. So yeah, so sometimes we see we see um, uh, fluid spaces that are wacky, like, yeah. like you said, and uh, we have to figure out, okay, what's the best tra way to treat it? And this is an example of a wacky fluid space. So <laughs> here we see um, lots of fluid in the ventricles, lateral ventricles that we saw in the uh, prior picture, but yeah, also there's a funny looking space there in the back of the head. Yeah, I see that. And uh, uh, that we were contemplating on what to do with it. A lot of the times, if that space communicates with all the other spaces, it can be treated with just one catheter. Sure. But in this particular instance, we didn't think so. And we had some sequences um, that we had done with the MRI scanner to sort of prove to us that that was a, an isolated fluid space. Yeah. So we inserted a catheter in there as well and connected them both to a pressure valve um, hoping that now all compartments are under the same pressure. Just and so people understand, uh, one catheter is in a very say standard position in what's called the lateral ventricle. Yeah. Where's the other catheter? So the other catheter is in this large uh, fluid space yeah. in the posterior part of the brain where the cerebellum is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually uh, sort of uh, sort of on, on, on top of the cerebellum, as you see uh, uh, from the it, it progressive even scans. It doesn't look like there's a lot of cerebellum there, does it? No, initially, <laughs> yeah. um, so what we were thinking is, is this a, a child with a hypoplastic cerebellum? cerebellum? Yeah, sure. Is that a, yeah. uh, what, what's called a dandy walker? Uh, versus is this maybe an arachnoid cyst? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's another entity called Blake's Pouch, which uh, we believe that this, uh, this uh, particular uh, problem was where, where they, some of the foramina that allow outflow from the fluid space are, are, are not formed. Um, and, and I think looking at the uh, scan all the way on the right, uh, that's probably the most likely diagnosis because the cerebellum looks pretty much normal. Yeah, that, that scan on the right looks about as darn near normal of a brain that you could hope for. Right. Yeah. So if this was a hypoplastic cerebellum, that, yeah, that would, would not, not happen. It wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't have grown. No, that's an awesome result. We have a question. Yeah. How should we evaluate a child with a shunt in the emergency department? So uh, the most important thing, like with any um, any problem that comes to the emergency room, is history and physical. Uh, so uh, finding out, uh, you know, what the problem is, when did the problem start, what are the symptoms, any associated symptoms, any kind of risk factors, any recent surgery, any mm -hmm. recent revision surgery, and then. Uh, um, kind of a weighing in, is this likely a shunt problem or not? If it's likely a shunt problem, or even if you are not sure, uh, that's a call to the neurosurgeon. Yeah. Based on the phone call, uh, we usually decide, uh, is, is it uh, uh, um, wise to get imaging? And we always try to get the least um, invasive, at least uh, harmful imaging. So, you know, if it's a little itty bitty baby, ultrasound or an MRI scan. Uh, if it's an outside uh, facility that maybe does not have an MRI scan available, and if it's in kind of a very serious looking situation, we, we, would, we would at that point um, possibly recommend a CAT scan. Yeah. Um, there's other things that can go with it. If we find that there's an abnormal looking uh, result of the MRI or the ultrasound, we would also maybe get x-rays to look at the tubing. Sure. Is there any disconnects in the tubing? Um, I probably, if everything looks normal and the follow-up scan looks normal, I would forego the 
imaging of the tubing because then you would say, hey, this is less likely to be a shunt problem. And of course, before you jump into anything, if it's a flu season or a, um, you know, any kind of other pediatric illness season, you want to rule those things out first if a child presents with uh, uh, fevers and not, sure. not feeling well. But some other things like classic neurologic things like nausea, vomiting, sleepiness, mm -hmm. irritability, headaches, I think those are all within uh, the purview of I have to worry about a shunt problem. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. I also want to know what is your preference for sedation when you obtain imaging on your patients? So the, the neat thing about the um, MRIs um, that we do at our hospital mm -hmm. is that they are so short that they are... Uh, just as uh, short as a CAT scan. So it's a three minute scan. The parent can go help uh, hold the child still and uh, usually we don't need any kind of sedation. So you were talking about uh, shunts, which means that there's hardware in place, mm -hmm. but you also alluded to when the kids get a little bit older, there are some neat tricks that you can do that are also minimally invasive yeah. uh, that can help kids with hydrocephalus problems. Yeah, so um, the, there's, there's not new, but there's, sure. <laughs> there's these alternative treatments uh, that we've tried to get shunts out of kids because once you have a shunt, you always have a shunt. And anytime something happens, um, you know, that, that becomes, could it be the shunt problem? And shunts, they are hardware, they can break, they can get infected, um, they can drain too much or too little. Uh, so, um, if we have a child that has a shunt failure, we always evaluate them to see are they a candidate for an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So here uh, we would make a pathway um, to allow the fluid to bypass the, um, the, the normal route and find another, another way to drain. This is a very useful uh, procedure for obstructive hydrocephalus where there's a blockage uh, from um, uh, the, the fluid getting from this, the lateral and the third ventricles to the fourth ventricle. But it also um, seems to work in, um, in non-communicating hydrocephalus fairly well. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, this is a... This is a a great option if yeah, uh, absolutely. the only only problem is that it doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and then you have the shunt. Yeah, <laughs> you the then shunt. you can always fall back. Yeah. And if you have a, a child that's under one years of age, you know, unfortunately, you know, 70% of the time it doesn't work. So uh, it, is it worth it because it's uh, putting a child through another surgery again? Another question is, what role does speech and cognitive therapy play in hydrocephalus patients? At what age, or do you wait to see if the shunt works? Or? So we always want to catch any kind of cognitive problems or speech problems early. So uh, we always uh, refer uh, children to early interventions, um, PT, OT. Most of the preemies are really kind of wrapped into these programs. Uh, as soon as as soon as they leave NICU, uh, to make sure that the, we optimize and give them the, all the opportunities to do very well. And and you know some of our children are just amazing. They you would never know that they were preemies yeah. when they come in, and it's uh, the most rewarding part of uh, pediatric neurosurgery is seeing these kids. And uh, it's, it's, we just we just love them. It, but it's clear that you're enamored uh, with your I population. Am, I want to hear, and, it, and, it, and it's wonderful. <laughs> but enough about me. Let's talk about uh, about you. <laughs> about you. Yeah, I, I think uh, you've just been uh, captivating everybody with uh, uh, just uh, your practice. Now, I know we call this. Um, uh, I think we call it seizures and shunts and everything in between, and so there are some things in between. But uh, maybe what we'll do is. Uh, We'll go to some of those other things. And uh, so fundamentally, this slide just says my name, but that doesn't really uh, matter much. But I'm Atom Sarkar. And what I really love about uh, being at St. Christopher's Hospital is uh, just the fun that we have operating. And we've got some 
pretty wonderful resources. We've got books, we've got uh, good partners, and we've got, uh, we've got ancillary folks to help. Yeah. And I think that's Snoopy, which is that's your right. uh, little that's rescue. Right. Snoopy's clearly an uh, uh, expert on cranial and spine problems as she's uh, eyeing the, the uh, sawbone. I, I suspect she wants to gnaw at it. But uh, we use all those resources because actually you'll remember there was one kiddo, uh, an eight-year-old, that was really apprehensive about what we had to do to her awake. Yeah. And Snoopy was her, um, I don't know, her comfort animal, her... Mm -hmm. her her pediatric benzodiazepine. Uh, she just got her to chill out and focus on the dog and we were able to do what we had to do. But it's a real treat to uh, operate at St. Christopher's Hospital. I think I'm not gonna focus on too much because I'd like to get to seizures because I think that uh, yeah. pediatric seizures are really important to talk about. But here's a slide that shows a case that I thought, uh, well, you brought to my attention and uh, we sort of polled some people throughout the United States and tried to figure out that this slide will show you, and it may not be in inherently obvious to everyone, but this was a 13-year-old black belt, right? And somehow yeah. he... Uh, a real ninja. Yeah, and somehow he fell and he lost, he, went, he became quadriparetic, didn't he? For yeah, so he was, he was doing his karate kicks yeah. and uh, he had a transient episode where he lost the function of his arms and legs. Yeah, and, and who would have thought that? Yeah. But that prompted some imaging and we've got different images here. We have uh, on the left a preoperative MRI scan which uh, shows that there's a problem at what's called the skull base, isn't there Tina? Yes, pretty tight there. Yeah, and not only that, then the CT scan showed us something even more interesting and he had a congenital problem called clipophile. Yeah. That's where the bones uh, don't uh, dissociate from each other in a normal manner. And this was a problem that was going to really, uh, uh, it wasn't going to abate. He needed something and he needed something before he got hurt. And you can see, I, I was sort of mocked up on that picture, there's this thing called C2 and it's got this bullet shaped peg and that is actually pushing into the brain stem and that would have been that was only going to get worse and that would have been a devastating injury so I, I remember the day we were in the operating room there was a lot of angst <laughs> there was, there was. But you had, um, you had uh, actually obtained something that was really really helpful um, can you tell us a little bit about what you got the uh, industry uh, people was, to do it was courage <laughs> <laughs> no what we did was so really, exactly. uh, this anatomy was very challenging. The anatomy was challenging, in particular the vascular structures were very challenging. And we, we created a model, because what I do when I do DBS is I get a lot of models uh, in understanding anatomy. And we had a model that was real to life and basically did the surgery before we ever did the surgery. And it was still, yeah. <laughs> it was still challenging. But, uh, but I think both you and I will say that we're pretty darn excited about that last picture on the on the right which shows a nearly near normal anatomy wouldn't you say i can't believe uh, how good it looks and i have to say that having that 3d printed model yeah. before going into the operating room and being able to see hey can we really do this yeah um lessened our anxiety because i i i mean i I probably would still be there if it wasn't for this one, <laughs> putting in one of the screws because this space was so darn small. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's really vital things going uh, uh, through those, those, those parts of the spine um, that can, the outcome can be very bad if we, we put our screw in the wrong place. Well, speaking of screws, I think that these are a different type of screw and I think you'll remember this. So now we're really getting on to epilepsy. And epilepsy is something that I sort of take a soapbox with because in the adult population, people will go for as much as 18 years before they get evaluated by a, uh, what we call a, a tertiary or quaternary uh, epilepsy center. And if you think about that, that's almost like you have a flat tire, mm -hmm. you walk away from your car and you come back in two decades and you say, hey, let's fix this. And I think that that is a real, real uh, sort of challenge, uh, epidemiological challenge and a societal challenge.
Because you take people that would otherwise be functional and you give them a brain problem that goes on for two decades, which means that precludes their ability to work, go to school, have jobs, drive, or be functional. And so I'm a real stalwart about moving uh, aggressively forward with identifying what happens in epilepsy. And we've uh, actually uncovered people at St. Christopher's Hospital that we feel that we've been able to very positively impact, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And that's why um, Atom puts uh, crayons on the <laughs> brain there. Can you tell us what, 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 what's that? Well, well that, that just shows that I've got better PowerPoint skills than you do. <laughs> but uh, fundamentally, uh, what we did was um, those screws are put into the head. And that, uh, this kiddo was 11, and so he didn't need your dog. Uh -huh. uh, and he was actually really fascinated. He was just so geeky about this. He kind of reminds me of me. And just wanted to know, he just wanted screws in his head, and he wanted those electrodes, and he wanted us to listen to his brain. Uh -huh. Because we had to figure out where his uh, seizures were coming from. And nobody had been able to do that yet. And so those electrodes, effectively are in the brain and they're highlighting different places. The next slide is an MRI scan uh, and this MRI scan gives us just phenomenal anatomic resolution. There are some funny names here, the hippocampus, the uh, neocortex, and the insula, but all of those places are literally just millimeters apart from each other, but it makes a difference as to where we can localize seizures. And if we can localize and point to one spot, then we can usually stop it, take it out, or use some other kind of really cool brain-machine interfaces. And uh, you may recall in Azraya, we were really lucky, and this was an example of a seizure, we were really lucky to find out that this seizure, and that's what you're seeing in purple in that sort of top on the side, the very, very squiggly lines, we're able to localize where those seizures were coming from. That was the good news. The bad news was that he had an anatomic structure of language that would have probably put him at risk if we yeah. would have done this surgery. So believe me, I'm a surgeon, you're a surgeon, we love to operate, but we don't like to hurt people, we wanna help folks. And so we knew enough from this that we had to come up with a even more clever solution, so to speak. You remember that? And can you tell, uh, can, can you just uh, explain how you figured out that the language might be affected? Well, uh, we were lucky enough that uh, our group at Global Neuroscience, we've got uh, dual trained uh, vascular surgeons and we were able to do a study called a WADA study. And I think we we're really blessed with the fact that we have four people that can do that. And so uh, they've been able to help us in these kind of cases. Um, and what we did here was we realized that if language was at risk, and you can see in this other picture, there was a, yet another spot that was also uh, causing seizures that couldn't be removed. We came up with a really, really, really uh, interesting way of mounting a brain pacemaker. That's an intraoperative picture of a brain machine interface with artificial intelligence into which there's a microprocessor that those wires feed into and they're constantly monitoring the brain and when they learn the brain seizures, you'll see this is real live EEG with somebody walking, talking. I mean, this is, this is incredible. This is like science fiction. And this is what I love about functional neurosurgery. And uh, you may not know it, but Azariah has not had any seizures since his operation, whereas before he did. And finally, that's what he looks like with that uh, mock-up. He's got a battery in his head. He's got a microprocessor in his head, all in the skull, and then he's got uh, these electrodes that are stopping him from having those seizures. So from the outside, you can't see you can't that see there's any of these devices. No. It's no. not like he has to wear a hat. For the no. <laughs> he can choose to. I think he wears a slacker hat, but, uh, but he doesn't have to. I don't know if you remember this case. Do you? Uh, this is uh, here. Here, here are some pictures that are will remind you of uh, of our stroll down uh, epilepsy lane. Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> this was. Uh, I think Caleb is thirteen. Yeah. And he had seizures, mm -hmm. and somehow we couldn't understand why there wasn't a deeper investigation into where his seizures were coming from. There was also a 
something very abnormal in his MRI that to begin with. That was the thing, exactly. And for whatever reason, our colleagues were just content because everyone's anxious with kids. Yeah. Should we do an operation? Should we not do an operation? It's always easier to use medications. But of course, you and I said, well, whoa, 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 what is that? And there was that something that's kind of hi highlighted in yellow. And that was more likely than not to be a tumor, remember? And that tumor, unfortunately, is awfully close to a very critical area in his brain that was responsible for sensation. And yes. so this was a little bit of a hybrid operation. This was both taking tumor surgery and epilepsy surgery and combining them into one. Again, the uh, middle scan shows that we've got some electrodes in uh, the brain. And what we did, I, I can't recall if you were there when we did this, but we actually, stim not only did we record where the seizures were coming from, mm -hmm. but later we stimulated the patient and found out that we had a very, very precarious window of literally a no-fly zone where if we went any further, we would cause some degree of irreparable yeah. damage. Yeah. And that was really critical for our navigation on that case. And you can see in the last picture, there's a hole in the head, which is okay, maybe not uh, something that everyone wishes for, but if the hole in the head takes out your seizure and it takes out your tumor and it leaves you seizure free, I think that that was a real victory for us that day. Certainly. And he's, uh, and he's seizure free. Seizure free? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the tumor's out. So and the tumor's out, uh, exactly. Two for one? Yeah, absolutely. Two for one. Yeah. Can you stop seizure medicine after this? So I always tell people that while that may be a goal and that may be something that they uh, strive for, we leave that up to the epileptologist and typically they will keep patients on their anti-epileptics for up to two years and then slowly they'll start to wean them down because there's no, um, there's no joy in saying uh, we've taken away your seizure meds and then a seizure comes back and so we like to be very, very um, cautious here. The goal is not to be medication free, the goal is to be seizure free and sometimes that goal comes with both medication and surgery. And usually or pretty much always those patients who are controlled with medication they never come to us. Yeah, that's they, true. You know, that's we true. don't operate. If the medications work, great. But if you are taking medications and you're still having seizures, that's not good for the brain. No, no, not at all. And I think that we you know, both you and I always say we're defenders of the brain and we don't want anyone to have any seizures, whether they're aware of them or not, because that is not good for brain physiology. And so that's why I think we're both real strong advocates for being very aggressive up front at identifying where the problem is, not necessarily then saying you have to have a surgery, but we want to identify the focality of the problem. Yeah. You know. This is something that we're doing um, in real time and uh, this is actually a case that I think shows uh, the highlights of how having a multidisciplinary team with our neurologists and uh, with ourselves, amongst ourselves, chatting really, really helps in uh, getting great outcomes. Um, this uh, looks like uh, we've turned somebody's head into a pincushion. Uh, those are electrodes, and those electrodes are arrayed throughout the brain. Before we got to our, um, I think this is an eight-year-old, isn't it? Yeah, this is actually yeah. um, where um, the, the, one of the recommendations was to take out the whole one, side of the brain. One half of the head, and we said, well, <laughs> hold on. Who's going to do that? And because we, we know how to do that, but we're only going to do that if we have to. And so they didn't even understand, or there was not an understanding of where, whether seizures were coming from the right brain or the left brain, and all those electrodes were helping us try to identify that. Ultimately, uh, we were able to find out, this was just a couple weeks ago, that all the seizures were coming from those highlighted areas. They were all in the left brain. One was in that back area called the parietal lobe in pink, and two were in areas in the orange and the blue that were uh, in more critical areas. So we had an idea that we were going to do both an open surgery to resect, and then ultimately, I think in a couple of weeks, we're gonna use yeah. another brain pacemaker again. That pink area is now gone, and that's that funny island that um, Adam made there. Yeah. And uh, the neat trick was to follow that catheter through all the way to um, the bottom, 
and just take that surrounding brain out to be really, really accurate only to touch the brain that was seizing. We've only got about 10 seconds. I'm just going to show a picture of our karate kid. And then the other kiddo is the one, uh, is Azariah, who's got the brain pacemaker in. And I think we're just happy that we can offer amazing therapies to our patients. Thank you.